What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, and today we're going to check out the brand new OnePlus 3, one of the most anticipated phones of the year. The OnePlus 3 really stands out for flagship design and specs, but mid-range pricing at $399. And this time, no invite system, you can buy this right now from their store, and I'll leave that linked in the description below. It's also available in two colors, graphite as we have here, and soft gold, which is coming later. Now before we get to the phone itself, let's get to the unboxing, and it's kind of a special one this time because they sent it in this huge piece. PR kit, which includes many of the accessories that are available for the OnePlus 3 on the store. We also get this pamphlet, which highlights all of the features and specs of the OnePlus 3, and it's really nice to have this for the review. So once we slide open the box, you can see we have lots of goodies to take a look at, including the OnePlus 3 at the center. But first, let's take a look at the cases. So we have a lot of case options that are available for the OnePlus 3. That includes the sandstone texture case. That case sort of picks up where the previous generation phones left off. Because we have an all-metal phone this time, uh, we have to put this case on if you like that sandstone texture from the previous generation. Another accessory is the car charger. And this works with the dash charging system. So if you want high-speed charging in your car, you have this accessory as an option. Now the accessory itself is actually really nicely designed. It has this knurled metal design, very similar to a knob inside a high-end car. So it sort of matches. So it's not just a cheap accessory. It also comes with a dash compartment compatible charging cable. You have to remember, in order to use Dash, you have to use compatible cables and chargers. Also included is the OnePlus Loop VR. So this is a VR headset specifically designed for the OnePlus 3. So it's a very nice headset. The phone basically just slots in the front of the headset and you can use the adjustable straps to mount it to your face and it does have a nice padded surface so it's comfortable to wear. And lastly, let's get to the OnePlus 3 itself which also has really nice packaging. It's all white and red. So when you lift open the box, you can see the phone front and center on this very nice plastic tray. So once we lift the phone off the tray, you can see that inside we have some paperwork. Now once we slide that tray out, we'll find a SIM ejection tool toward the bottom. We'll also find some paperwork, which includes a user guide and user manual. And you also find a set of stickers, which is kind of nice. Now underneath this pamphlet, we'll find all of the accessories. And behind this pamphlet, we'll actually find a message from the CEO. And if you want to read this, you can go ahead and pause the screen. Now a real standout feature of the OnePlus 3 is the dash charging system. And this charging brick is a big part of it. So although it's larger than a standard charger, it does most of the power management, which means the heat that's generated by charging doesn't make it to the phone itself. So the phone stays really cool. It actually works very effectively. Now this rapid charging system can actually charge this 3000 milliamp hour battery to 60% in only 30 minutes. And because the phone doesn't overheat, the phone doesn't have to dial back charging speed when you're actually using it, especially when you're gaming. So it can continue rapidly charging your phone even if you're using it. Now you can still charge your phone using standard USB-C power adapters, but you won't get rapid charging. Now the phone does indicate whether you're charging rapidly or not, and you'll see that indicated on the lock screen or with a lightning icon in the status bar. Now getting back to the phone, there is a small sticker along the back which tells you about the dual SIM setup in this phone. We also have a sticker with our IMEI and serial number information that we can peel off. And once we do, the phone is completely free of any regulatory or serial number markings. So it's a really nice clean design. So taking a close look at the OnePlus 3, the design is pretty familiar. It looks like a lot of other phones sort of combined together, but it's a really nice looking design, especially for this price. Now, of course, it's all aluminum and we do have those antenna stripes at the top and bottom. The design itself kind of a combination of rounded edges and sharp creases, which creates a really nice looking design overall. Now the phone is only 7.35 millimeters thick, but along the side, you'll notice that it sort of curves in, which gives you a narrower grip. We've seen this design from other phones like Samsung. Now along the right side of the phone, we'll find a sleep-wake power button, and just above that, we'll find our dual nano SIM tray. When you eject this for the first time, you'll see that we have these little nano SIM inserts, which you can pop out and then install your own SIM. And of course, these SIMs are assignable under settings. Unfortunately, there is no micro SD card slot in here, but we do get 64 gigs of internal storage standard, which is great at this price. Along the left side, we'll find a volume rocker and a feature returning from the OnePlus 2, which is the alert slider. So this is sort of a three-position slider that allows you to select whether you want all of your notifications, only your priority notifications, or if you just want to mute everything. And that's customizable under settings. Now toward the top of the phone, you won't find anything at all. Very clean design, but if you look at the bottom, you'll find your speaker, USB-C connector, headphone jack, and microphone, in addition to screws at either side. In terms of speaker quality, it's somewhat similar to the iPhone, which is to say it's a really good speaker, although it'd be nice if we had front-facing stereo speakers, but it's loud and clear without distortion, so it doesn't sound too tinny, doesn't sound too hollow, or too muffled. 
So taking a look at the back of the phone, very clean design, and we do have NFC hidden back here. So NFC finally returns, which we lost with the OnePlus 2. Toward the top, if you look at the antenna stripe at the center, we'll find our microphone. And of course, right below that protruding now is a 16 megapixel camera with an f2.0 aperture. It can also record in 4K video with optical image stabilization. And right below that, we'll find an LED flash. So this is a camera with specs that really keep up with flagship smartphones. And we're gonna test that out in this video. Now getting to the front of the phone, the first thing you'll notice right away is that we have a pre-installed screen shield. And if you don't want it, you can peel this off, but I left it on for the purposes of this video. So it might be a visual distraction, but just remember it can be taken off. Now on the front of the phone, we have this Corning Gorilla Glass 4 cover glass, which wraps around the edges. And this combines with a very narrow bezel to create an effect that makes the display look like it's sort of floating above the phone. A really nice thin bezel creates a nice compact phone. And generally speaking, it's a really attractive design that feels great in the hand because all these surfaces are nice, smooth, and rounded. Now, before we talk about the display, let's get to the things that are around it. So toward the top, we have an LED notification light. We also have our ambient light sensor and proximity sensor in addition to our earpiece. We also have our eight megapixel front-facing camera, which does have an F2.0 aperture. Down below, we'll find our home button, which is also a fingerprint scanner, which is faster than ever. It's a really quick fingerprint scanner. Excellent feature that works reliably. And beside it, we'll find our backlit capacitive Android navigation keys, which are nondescript. They're basically just dots because they're programmable. Now, I have to keep in mind that the home button is capacitive, so it's not a physical click, it's just a tab. Now getting to the display, this is a 5.5 inch 1080p optic AMOLED display. So 1080p is kind of a bad word right now because a lot of people expect quad HD for flagship specs. But you have to keep in mind that the iPhone 6s Plus also has a 1080p display, 5.5 inches. And both phones look fantastic. They have great displays and they're very sharp and clear. And you're definitely not going to see the pixels unless you basically bring the phone to your eyes. And that's where it might become a problem. And that's if you're using this with VR. VR obviously can benefit from higher resolution displays. Uh, be again, because the display is right in front of your face. But generally speaking, this is a fantastic display with bright, clear whites, which do shift a little toward the blue side compared to something like an LCD screen or something like uh, Samsung's displays, but it's a really good looking display with bright vivid colors, deep blacks, great off axis viewing angles, and it's just a nice bright display. Now they call this an optic display, and that's because we have a dual polarizing layer, which means that this display remains very visible outdoors in external lighting conditions. So instead of washing out the display, external light really has no effect. You can still see this clearly. So in terms of our specs, again, this is a 2016 flagship phone. So of course we have a Snapdragon 820 clocked at 2.2 two gigahertz. Not common is six gigs of RAM. This is one of the first phones to get that much RAM, which provides a lot of breathing room. We also get 64 gigs of onboard storage standard. It's not expandable, but this is also faster storage. So this is UFS 2.0 technology, which moves data three times faster than more common EMMC 5.1 storage. So of course this delivers excellent Geekbench scores, around 2400 on the single core score and almost 5500 on the multi-core score. That more than doubles the single core score of the previous generation. And it brings the single core score pretty close to the iPhone 6S Plus and of course the multi-core score well clears it. So in terms of day-to-day -day performance, again, we have Android 6.0 with a very light skin and with a 1080p display and all this processing power, this phone just flies through its operating system. So it's a very smooth operating phone. You're able to get around really quickly. And generally speaking, it's a really pleasant experience and I really enjoy using this phone. However, when it comes to RAM, there is some controversy here and that's because the RAM management system seems to be ignoring all the RAM it has available to itself. So that means it's not suspending apps as well as you would expect it to. So it's reloading apps more frequently than you expect when you recall them. Ideally, we should see 10 plus apps in full suspension so you can immediately recall them when you need them. But unfortunately, that's not happening here. We're seeing about five apps in full suspension and then it reloads everything else. OnePlus 3 says they're doing this to preserve battery life and that's a more important factor to consider than suspending background apps that you may not be using in the first place. In terms of battery performance, we have a 3000 milliamp hour battery, which is pretty standard for phones around this size and it delivers pretty standard results. I'm seeing almost about four and a half hours of on-screen time at maximum brightness in my benchmark testing. So in terms of camera quality with 60 megapixels, again, you have a lot of resolution to work with. And if you have plenty of light, you see a lot of detail that's very crisp and clear with good color reproduction. My only complaint is that it tends to be a little on the overexposed side, but generally speaking, it's pretty standard stuff for flagship smartphones. Now where things sort of soften here is when you're in low light conditions with an F2.0 aperture, uh, you don't quite have as much uh, light coming into the camera as you might have 
have with an f1.7 or 1.8 aperture like we're seeing with some other flagship smartphones the other issue is that the image processor in here is very aggressive so it tends to soften a lot of detail in order to mitigate the noise that comes with 60 megapixel sensors and low light now the good thing about an f2.0 aperture is that the camera spends less time focusing so you're able to find focus a little more easily and more reliably now in terms of extremely low light performance it's actually very good so we see a good amount of detail it's nice and crisp without being too noisy it's not overexposed where things are blown out so it's just about right so you're able to see enough detail and color accuracy is also good so it doesn't look washed out so although you can probably find cameras with better sensitivity this one is pretty good overall now when we get to video, we have 4K and optical image stabilization. Unfortunately, handheld video looks pretty shaky, so it's definitely not up to snuff with other flagship smartphones, which usually can do a much better job in terms of stabilizing video. The other issue is that exposure compensation tends to hunt around abruptly, so when it adjusts for exposure, it really does look pretty unnatural. That's also true of continuous autofocusing, which tends to hunt around unnaturally. Another issue I've noticed with this camera is that it's prone to pixelation or artifacts uh, during recording, especially with 4K. Okay. Uh, so there may be some performance issues while recording 4K and hopefully this will be improved with software updates. What's going on guys? Mike here, the Detroit Borg, testing out the front-facing camera of the OnePlus 3, which has an 8 megapixel Sony sensor, an f2.0 aperture, and can record in 1080p resolution. Now it's a fairly decent camera, good detail and color reproduction. Uh, the only problem I seem to have is exposure compensation. So if I really challenge it, doesn't seem to be able to track my face correctly, so it's not adjusting exposure as well as I'd like to see like a lot of other flagship smartphones can do, but hopefully with software updates, they can improve this. The other concern I have is that audio pickup just isn't so good. It sounds kind of distant. Uh, so hopefully that can be improved with software. I'm not sure if it's hardware or software related, but maybe a third party camera app can do a bit better with both exposure and the microphone. Next up, let's walk through the interface. So this is Android 6.0 with Oxygen OS on top of it, which is fairly close to stock Android with a few tweaks we'll go through. Now, there are a few things to notice on the lock screen. First, we're just going to take a look at that fingerprint scanner, which is very fast and reliable. Just lightly tap your finger and it unlocks it very quickly. Now, if you tap the wrong finger, you do get this feedback, this vibration feedback that lets you know it's not working. Use the right finger and it will unlock for you. Getting to that lock screen, there are a few gestures to know about, which are not on by default, but you can turn them on under settings. Uh, so you can draw a circle to quickly launch into the camera app. That's very handy to have. Draw a V to launch the LED flash on the back or turn it off. Swipe down with two fingers to begin playback or resume playback of an audio app or music app you have in the background. Right now I have none running so it's not doing anything. You can also pause playback with the same gesture. Also you can just double tap the screen to wake it up to take you to the lock screen or you could swipe your hand in front of the screen to wake it up to show you your notifications. Now, because I was just talking about those gestures, let's go to settings to show you where they are. So you can see they're under personal, under gestures, and this is where you can turn them off entirely if you don't want them on, or you can individually control them. So getting back to the home screen, if we swipe right, we get to the shelf. So this is a little different than the Google Now launcher. It's sort of a spot for widgets. So you'll find things like the weather widget up top. We'll find all of our recently accessed apps right here, which is very handy. You have a memo app in addition to a reminders app, and you have your favorite contacts here. Now these are editable, so I can hold on them and swipe to uh, resize them if I want to, or swipe to dismiss them or delete them. So if I wait here, if I swipe right, I can dismiss that. And then I can go to add. So if I want to add that widget, back you can see the widgets that are available to me incidentally with this weather widget up top we have a few settings we can turn on and off so you can show the weather you can refresh the weather if you need to see the update or you can use Celsius but if you tap and hold on this we get to additional options such as the ability to change the wallpaper for this widget uh, so I'm just gonna go with one plus uh, wallpapers and I can select something like this one and position it to wherever I want to click done save and it applies the wallpaper now swiping down we can get to our notification panel which is fairly close to stock android but there are a few changes here so one of them is this night mode so they've added the night mode which sort of warms up the display now this is modifiable under settings so you can tap and hold on this to take you right to it so you can change the intensity of the night mode here so if you want a really orange display you can go with that or choose something toward the middle now unfortunately you cannot schedule this so this will not kick in automatically so getting back to this panel, you can edit this. So you can rearrange them if you want, and you can click save once you're done. But if you don't like what you just did, you can also restore it to default. We can also modify the home screen by tapping and holding on it, and you can see that we have this rearrange button. So this will rearrange everything, and you can undo it 
or you can delete all the apps from this page or undo that as well. We also have a wallpaper editor so you can edit the lock screen or home screen wallpaper and they've included some really nice ones as well so you can select them from down here. We also have customize and we have four distinct panels for customize and that includes our gestures which allows us to turn off the shelf. So if you don't want the shelf at all this is where you turn it off. So when you swipe to the right it doesn't work and you have to click save but we also have these two other gestures I can show you which are actually very useful. So again uh, the shelf is gone but if you want quick access to your notification panel just swipe down anywhere on the home screen so you don't have to reach toward the top to get to it swipe up and it takes you to your search assistant we can also change the Google search widget. So if you want to go for a different style or just turn it off, you can do so right here. We can also change the size of the icon. So we have standard, small, or large. And of course we have our icon packs here, but right now I just have the one standard icon pack. We also have the app drawer layout. So we can go for smaller, standard, or larger. So if you want more icons per screen, you can go that way. Speaking of the app drawer, we can bring this up and search for the apps, but you can also tap and hold to bring up the search tool for the app drawer. Now, if I drag and drop one of the home screen apps, I can take it up to remove or I can take it up to edit. And with edit, I can change the name of the app or I can change the icon for the app. And unfortunately right now, I don't have additional icons I can pick from. You can also do this from the app drawer. So all I have to do is take it up to edit and this will take you to the editor. Now, in terms of these Android navigation keys, they are highly customizable, but by default, if you have these off screen controls, you can see we do have Google Now and tap. All I have to do is tap and hold on the uh, home button and you can go right to Google Now if you prefer. We also also have back and recent apps and if you take a look at recent apps they've made some slight changes here so we do have our app manager which is available if we go to the settings button we also have clear all so if you want to close out all the apps and then we can also clear the background apps if we want to now for some of these apps you can actually lock them so you can't close them out so if I clear them all you can see those stay now these navigation buttons are highly customizable and once again we're gonna to go to settings to get to that so we're gonna swipe down to get to buttons under personal and you can see that we have our on-screen navigation bar. So if you want to turn that on and turn off the off-screen controls, you can do that. So none of these buttons are now active. Now, if you want to continue using the home button or the, uh, the fingerprint sensor as a home button, you can actually turn that on. So if you enable this, now it acts as the home button. You can also swap the buttons. Now this works for either on-screen or off-screen. So if you're used to the arrangement like this, you can change it back. Now, if you go with the on-screen buttons, you can see that the home button, recent button, and back button is no longer customizable. So let's go ahead and turn that off. And now you can see we have a long press or double press action that we can customize. So right now the home button is the only one programmed, but you can program the other buttons here. So for example, if you want the recents button to open up the shelf or whatever, you can do so right here. In terms of the app selection, it is fairly close to stock Android, but we have a few additions such as this file manager. So if you wanna navigate through your file tree, you can do so right here. It's a pretty basic uh, tool here. So you can see images, you can see your videos, audio, and that sort of thing. We also have a photo gallery app, so you can see your collections, which is broken down by camera or screenshot, and then you can see your photos. And if you tap on them, you can play them or swipe between them. We also have a music app. This is for loading locally stored music, and I have none, but you can see it's broken down by songs, artists, albums, and tags and you can go to more options to sort them. So getting to the camera app, it is fairly user friendly. So right now I'm in video mode and if you want to swap mode, you go to this upper left corner. This allows you to swap between photo and etc. Alternatively, you can also just swipe on the screen and it quickly toggles between photo and still mode. So in terms of taking photographs, just tap the shutter release. You can tap anywhere on the scene to adjust exposure or focus points. And then the great thing here is that if you have the uh, flash set to auto, and you have a dark scene, uh, this will tell you that it's actually going to use the flash. So right now I have plenty of light. So let me go ahead and turn on the flash to show you what it looks like. I actually find this very useful. It's kind of nice to have. We also have this HD mode we can toggle on and off. And with HD mode, it actually intelligently sharpens the image to make them even more brilliant. You can also go with HDR, which turns this off. So right now I have it set to HDR auto, and this will uh, take an HDR photo if it's determined it's needed. Now swiping to video mode, we can start recording our video. So right now I'm in Ultra HD, so it's telling me it's limited to 10 minutes in length. I can snap photographs while recording, pinch in and out as well, and I can turn on the flash if I need it. So there you go, turns on and off, and we can stop recording as well. Now if we go to our settings here, we can toggle between 1080p, 4K, and 720p, and you can turn on the grid if you want. Of course, we have other settings here, such as slow motion and time lapse, in addition to manual mode and panorama. And the manual mode is quite simple. So we have auto mode and we can adjust this like so. So if you want to change the uh, focus points, you can do so manually. We also have our aperture. So if you want to adjust your aperture, again, very nice controls. Uh, we also have our white balance. We have different white balance points we can use. 
And then we have our ISO level. So if you want to change the ISO level, you can do so manually. Of course, we can also choose between 16 by 9, 1 by 1, or 4 by 3. And then we have our timer for 3 seconds, 5 seconds, and 10 seconds. And we also have our grid as well. In terms of the settings, we do have a few features which are worth pointing out here on the OnePlus 3. So this is a dual SIM phone, so we have our SIM card settings right here. So right now I only have one card, but you can assign each card for different responsibilities for cellular data, for phone calls, or SMS messaging. Under display, we'll find things like our color balance. So this allows us to adjust for a warmer or cooler color temperature if we want. We also have our night mode. And we also have double press the power button in order to activate the camera. So if you double press the power button anywhere, this will launch the camera app, which is very handy to have. This is also where we can turn off ambient display and proximity wake. Now, if you turn off ambient display, proximity wake doesn't work anymore because basically proximity wake wakes up the ambient display. We also have the alert slider. So with the alert slider all the way down, we have all notifications. Swipe up and we can go to priority notifications toward the middle. So with priority notifications, we can customize exactly what is a priority here. So if you want to turn off some of these, you can. You can also uh, select specific contacts or messages as well as repeat callers if you want them to come through. And if we go to silent mode, you can also change the silent settings here as well. So you have alarms or media. Under customization, we have dark mode. So this will, in most cases, black out the white space on the phone's interface. So for example, within the settings panel, you can see it's all black now. This is great, especially for an AMOLED display, so it saves some battery life. You can also see that once we've activated this, we can actually change the accent color. So if you want to go with green or orange, you can do so, click OK, and all the accent colors are now orange. We also have our LED notifications, so you can customize this, and we do have per app notifications as well. So if you want to change the uh, settings for these, you can. And then we have the status bar. So if you want to limit what appears in your status bar, such as the Wi-Fi indicator, you can turn this off. So if you want an ultra clean interface, you can turn off many of these features. Now quickly before I leave, I just want to show the differences between the OnePlus 2 and the OnePlus 3 design. Now both of them still have 5.5 inch 1080p displays, but we go from an IPS display on the OnePlus 2 to an AMOLED display on the OnePlus 3, and that's a big improvement. On the back, there are bigger changes here. Obviously, the design is very different. We go from a metal frame with a removable back panel to an all-aluminum unibody design, which is thinner and definitely better looking, in my opinion. There's also some obvious differences in the camera hardware. So we have a bumped out 60 megapixel camera, uh, but we lose laser assisted autofocusing and a dual LED flash from the 13 megapixel camera system from the previous generation. The buttons have also changed around. So if you look at the right side on the OnePlus 2, we have both the volume rocker and the sleep wake power button that has been split between the left side and right side on the OnePlus 3, which I think is an improvement. Now along the bottom of the phone returning once again is USB-C, but this time we get dash charging. You can also see that some of the ports have been moved around. So the headphone jack has moved from the top on the OnePlus 2 to the bottom on the OnePlus 3. Now in the end, the OnePlus 3 really isn't about the bells and whistles, it's about getting the basics right, which is surprisingly difficult to do for a lot of smartphone makers. Now it's got a great design, great build quality, fantastic display, a decent speaker system, good battery life, and a software experience that doesn't get in the way. And of course, we have specs that go above and beyond the modern flagship smartphone, so we're all set to go. Of course, this isn't a perfect flagship smartphone. The camera system definitely isn't as competitive as I would like to see, but hopefully software updates could improve this in the future. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up to let me know, and I'll see you again in the next one.